Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on anti-cancer chemotherapy. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the drug methotrexate, which inhibits the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme in human cells. Methotrexate. Okay, right. So, the structure for this video, then, is we are going to see uh, the function of the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme. We're going to see the target for this drug, methotrexate. We're then going to see um, what that enzyme actually does and how it's really important in the production of thymidine monophosphate, which is one of the essential uh, nucleotides for construction of DNA. Okay. We're then going to discuss what inhibiting the enzyme will do, what effect that will have on the cell. And we're then going to talk about um, how we can cope with the side effects of this drug, because this is actually an extremely toxic uh, chemotherapeutic agent. I recently went to uh, a um, Christmas pantomime, which was done uh, by the clinical medical school, and they used, it was a mock of Peter Pan, and basically, this was the drug that Hook used to poison Tinkerbell. Okay, so it's a not a nice drug, uh, but it is a very effective anti-cancer chemotherapy. Right, okay, so we'll start off with the uh, importance of the folic acid pathway in producing deoxythymidine monophosphate. Okay, so this starts off with uh, folic acid then. So, we'll start off with discussing the structure of folic acid and how you convert folic acid into tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so folic acid then. We all know folic acid. We all recognise it as a name. It's something that, um, you know, is very important for pregnant women to take and things like that. It's in, you can get multivitamins with it in. So it's also often referred to as vitamin B9. Okay, so vitamin B9. So there isn't just one B vitamin, there are many vitamin Bs. And folic acid is often referred to as vitamin B9. Okay, so let's now discuss the structure of folic acid. So folic acid has two rings in it, and I want to discuss one of the very important rings uh, that's going to... Well, actually, we'll discuss two important types of aromatic ring, which we're going to see a lot in this discussion. Okay, so the first type we'll discuss is a pyrimidine ring, okay? So, pyrimidine rings are very similar to benzene rings, except that two of the elements in the ring have been replaced by nitrogen. So, benzene, remember, is a six-carbon ring. So, in fact, maybe we should start our discussion with this, a reminder of the structure of benzene. And we'll be drawing skeletal structures throughout this video, because they're just easier on the eye than molecular formulae. Okay, so benzene is this six-membered carbon ring, so let's draw a hexagon. Okay, so you've got these six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. And remember, in structural formulae, you do not show carbon atoms, you just show them as corners. So where there are corners, that implies that there is a carbon atom there. Okay, and then between the carbons, you have alternating double and single bonds. So you have double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, etc. And then, in structural formula, you do not show hydrogens that are bound to carbon atoms, okay? So where there is a missing bond off a carbon atom, it's implicit that that is a bond to a hydrogen atom. So, for instance, every single one of the carbons in this six-membered benzene ring has a missing bond. So it's implied that every single carbon has a single bond to a hydrogen atom, basically. Okay, so that's the structure of benzene. Now let's see how the pyrimidine ring is similar to benzene. So again, it's a six-membered ring, only this time two of the members are nitrogen atoms. Okay, so here we go. So two nitrogens, four carbons. So one carbon is up here, second here, third here, and fourth here. And then you have these two nitrogens separated by a single carbon in between them. Okay, and then you have alternating double and single bonds. Now again, this is a skeletal structure, so uh, the carbons are not shown, they're implied by the corners. The nitrogens are shown, and all the missing bonds that you have off the carbons, they are implied to be hydrogens. 
Okay, and the nitrogens don't need any more bonds because they've got three bonds and that saturates a nitrogen atom. So this is a pyrimidine ring. The next and last little uh, thing that I want to discuss first is what a pyrazine ring is. And this is going to be very important. So, pyrazine ring then. A pyrazine ring is very similar to a pyrimidine ring, except that the nitrogens are now at the two poles of the ring rather than having a single carbon in between them. So it's still an altered benzene ring where you have now the nitrogens not with a single carbon in between them but with two carbons in between them. So this is the structure of a pyrazine ring. And again we're drawing skeletal structures so we don't show carbons, neither do we show hydrogens off carbons, and these nitrogens are fully saturated so there's nothing extra coming off those. Okay, so this is the structure of a pyrazine ring. So, without further ado, let's see the structure of folic acid. So, folic acid contains near pyrimidine rings, and it certainly contains pyra pyrazine rings. Okay, right. Uh, so, the structure of folic acid then. You start off with a ring that's almost a pyrimidine ring, and when we come to the structure of methotrexate, it's actually going to have an almost identical structure to folic acid, except that it is going to have a full pyrimidine ring, and we'll see that later. Okay, so, oh, whoops, I've missed this nitrogen off here, sorry. So here's the nitrogen here, and then we have alternating double and single bonds, but then we do not have this double bond here. Instead, you have a carbonyl group up here, and a hydrogen off this nitrogen. And remember, you do have to show hydrogens that are off non-carbon atoms. Okay, and then finally you also have an amino group down here, H2N. Okay, right, then, bound to this, you then have a pyrazine ring, so this six-membered ring with alternating double and single bonds. Okay, like so. Then what you have is a methylene group here, which goes off up to a nitrogen up here. I'm just wondering, worrying now whether this is going to fit in. And then off this nitrogen, you have a hydrogen, which I'll stick up there, and also a benzene ring, which sticks off here. Okay, and I hope this will all fit in. So here's our benzene ring, alternating double and single bonds. Okay, and then off here we have a carboxylic acid group that's bound to an amino group, making it an amide group here. Okay, like so. Right, and we're going to have to go off at an odd angle now. Uh, I would usually go back up there, but obviously we don't have enough uh, space for that. Or Actually, I can try. I'll try. So then, what you have up here is like so. So basically, you've taken this carboxylic acid group here, and you've bound it to the amino group of an amino acid. And the amino acid you've got up here is actually going to be glutamate. So here's the carboxylic acid group of the... Uh, generic amino acid structure. So remember, in an amino acid structure you have an acid group, an alpha carbon in the middle, and then an amino group over here. And the amino group is involved in an amide link between uh, the glutamate molecule and this uh, carboxylic acid group coming off the benzene ring. Okay, then we just need to complete the R group of this glutamate, so let's do that. So we've got one methylene group, two methylene groups, and then on the end we've then got a carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, so that now is the structure of folic acid, okay, or vitamin B9. Now, let's talk about how we convert this into um, dihydrofolate reductase. So we want, uh, sorry, dihydrofolate. So basically, folic acid is an essential vitamin, and now we're going to see why it's an essential vitamin. Okay, so what do cells do with folic acid? Well, basically, they convert it into dihydrofolate and then into tetrahydrofolate. So let's firstly see the conversion that takes it into dihydrofolate. So we'll start with this conversion. So again, we draw out this starting near pyrimidine ring over here. Okay, so the carbonyl group's up here, and I'll try and include this nitrogen this time. So here's our nitrogen down here. Got this double bond here, double bond here, and we've got an amino group coming off here. Okay, then we've got our pyrazine ring here. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is that we are going to 
uh, break one of these double bonds in this pyrazine ring, we are basically going to bring in two hydrogen atoms, and also, so, well, two hydrogen atoms, that's what we're going to actually bring in. So two hydrogen atoms consists of the hydrogen nuclei and also two electrons. So remember the structure of a hydrogen atom, or at least the structure of the most common isotope of hydrogen, is that you have a single proton at the centre and then an electron around it. So we bring in two protons, two uh, hydrogen nuclei, and then two electrons as well. Of course, you can have different isotopes of hydrogen. This is actually the protium isotope of hydrogen. Uh, the, there is also the deuterium and the tritium isotope, where you have differing numbers of neutrons. So in protium, you have no neutrons. So zero neutrons, one proton, one electron is protium. Then in deuterium, you would then have one neutron, one proton, one electron, so one of each. And then finally, in tritium, the final of the common forms of hydrogen, uh, common in um, quotation marks, um, you would have two neutrons, one proton, and one electron. But the main form of hydrogen is just protium. So you have no neutrons and just a proton and an electron, like I've drawn here. OK, so you bring two hydrogen nuclei and two electrons, so two hydrogen atoms overall. And what you're going to do, basically, is you're going to cleave this bond here. So you're going to break this second of the two bonds between this nitrogen and this carbon. So you're only going to break one of the bonds. You're not going to break both of the bonds in that double bond. You're just going to break the second one. And that would send one electron back to nitrogen and one electron back to carbon. They'll then have unpaired electrons, and what each one of them will then bind to a hydrogen atom. So we've brought in two hydrogen atoms. One will bind to this carbon, and one will bind to this nitrogen. Okay, so what we'll get is this. So we've got a single bond here now. We show the hydrogen off the nitrogen, but we don't show the hydrogen off the carbon. Before, in this structure, this carbon only had one hydrogen coming off it. Now it's got two, but we don't show that, remember. Okay, so then we've got this methylene group going up to our nitrogen up here with this hydrogen off, and I'm trying to squash it in now to get everything to fit in. Our tiny little benzene ring that's just going to have to cope with being tiny. Okay, and then it's got these alternating double and single bonds, and then we'll have a massive great bond here just to get us past this. Then we'll have our carbonyl group there, our amide link here, Okay, and then up here we have our carboxylic acid group of our amino acid here. We have our alpha carbon here, and our R group of um, glutamate down here. Okay, so this now, this is the structure of dihydrofolate. Okay, dihydrofolate, often abbreviated to DHF for short dihydrofolate. Okay, and this reaction, this reduction reaction here, is carried out by an enzyme which is often abbreviated to DHFR, okay, standing for dihydrofolate reductase. And that enzyme's name will make more sense in a moment when we've looked at what will happen to dihydrofolate. At the moment, it doesn't seem to make any sense because um, we have not reduced dihydrofolate. We've reduced folic acid. Okay, so why is it called dihydrofolate reductase? Surely it should be called folate reductase. And by the way, folic acid and folate are the same thing. Okay, they well, strictly speaking, they're not, but they're tr as far as we're concerned, they are the same thing. One is the conjugate base of the other. Folic acid is the molecule when you actually have a hydrogen bound to this um, uh, oxygen here, okay? Folate is the molecule when it's lost its proton. So folic acid is known as an acid for a reason, because it can donate protons away. Specifically, it can donate this proton off this carboxylic acid group here. Okay, when it donates the proton away, it then 
leaves this oxygen with no proton on it and with a negative charge on it, that molecule that you end up with is folate. Um, so as far as we're concerned, you know, it will be switching between being a folic acid and a folate molecule, and people will use these two interchangeably. Okay, and this carboxylic acid group has nothing to do with the reaction we're looking at anyway, so it's trivial to us whether this is protonated or not, and frankly it will be switching between being protonated and unprotonated continuously. So sometimes it will be folic acid, sometimes it will be folate, etc. Um, so use the two interchangeably, basically. Okay, right, uh, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.